All right, we're going to invite Renee up. So Renee Walker from IAG giving the first part of the seminar. Thanks. Come on up. Thank you, Sarah. Now, I see a number of familiar faces in the audience, so I apologise if you feel like I'm telling you the same things again, but actually sometimes I think that helps because it is such technical information. I have been asked to talk about cash settlement, so I'm going to talk about cash settlement and how that works. And then John will talk a bit more about what the differences between cash settlement and a managed reinstatement are. Um, I am from IAG, so I can only really talk on behalf of IAG. But in many cases, most insurers will have a similar way of settling claims through cash settlement. And if you have a specific question about your claim, and it's not with IAG, still ask me about it afterwards, because I've got contacts at each of the insurers. So I can go back to the insurer for you. So what do you need to consider in terms of cash settlement? And I always come about this from a customer point of view. So what should you think about? So what you need to know is that a cash settlement is based on what your insurer can assess at the time of assessment and how much they estimate this would cost to reinstate at the time they make the offer. If you have any concerns about your property, then you, you are within your rights to ask for more invasive assessment. And you will have seen in the media over the last couple of days, the more invasive testing methods that are available for foundations, for example. So most insurers will have a way of checking foundations that might involve a miniature type camera that goes under the house. So if you are looking at a cash settlement, then you would ask for that type of assessment probably to be done of your foundations to give you confidence about the foundation repair that's been costed. If you had concerns about walls, you might ask for invasive testing of the wall linings. It really does depend though. The first thing you want to think about is what it is your intention. So if your intention is to reinstate exactly what you had, then you'd want to go to the nth degree in terms of assessment. If your intention is maybe to demolish what's there and build something completely different or to rebuild at a different site or to purchase an existing house somewhere else, then it might be a different conversation because you might have a dollar figure in mind that you need, you know that you need that dollar figure to move on. So you might not get as caught up in the assessment, but you might have a conversation with your insurer about the dollar figure. And I think the important message, and you'll get this through my presentation and John's, is have that conversation. So we do get feedback that people feel like their insurer is going to offer them a number and they have no choice but to take it. Absolutely not. It is a conversation. It is a negotiation. I've been involved in a number this week. Um, one that was really good was with a broker involved. So we went to the broker's premises. The insured was there. So um, a husband and wife and a lawyer from their family trust. We had a meeting first and we discussed the scope. We discussed the engineering. The loss adjuster explained all of that to both parties. And then the insured left and went into another room with their broker and we stayed in a room, we discussed what we thought there was movement on, they discussed what they thought they needed, we came back together and we were able to settle, but it was definitely a negotiation and the most important thing was the conversation and everyone understanding what a good outcome looked for, like for the insured. If you're not getting that face-to-face -face, um, conversation, then there are ways of making that happen. So RAS is a really good service and you can go to RAS, the Residential Advisory Service, and they can start that process for you. Um, most insurers will have some kind of mediation service or some kind of specialist team. And I mean, this is the benefit of this hub. If you're not getting anywhere, then I can help with that. But there are ways of having that conversation. So don't feel like you have to accept what's given to you. You can have that negotiation. Um, with a cash settlement, it is generally a full and final payment. And I say generally because it's not always. And it is really dependent, again, on intention and on site. So um, an example of a full and final payment would be if you're happy with the scope to the existing property, um, you're happy that it captures everything, you believe that that um, is it's fair for the damage that has been incurred and you're going to do something different with it, then you might accept a full and final payment because that allows you to move on and do whatever you like. If you um, are going to reinstate exactly what you had and you had some nervousness around foundations, for example, then you might want a partial discharge and the partial discharge might leave the foundations out and then you get your insurer to do the foundations and you sign your full and final for above ground only. But that's really a gain through that conversation and a gain where RAS can help because they have a technical panel. So if you had concerns about your foundations and you didn't feel like you could just discuss those with your insurer, you might discuss 
discussing with the RAS technical panel and um, leave that part out of the settlement. If you do take a full and final payment though, that means once a payment has been accepted, your claim is closed and it's generally not able to be reopened even if you do find previously unidentified damage or costs escalate. So again, that's why you want to be confident around the scope of the damage and the costs associated with that scope. If you need to move out during your reinstatement, if you haven't already used your alternative accommodation payment, then generally there will be one under your policy and that will be included in your settlement. For most of the IAG policies, that's $20,000 or a percentage of contents and other insurers would be similar. And inflation costs, this is a question that's come up through the hub. So if your assessment was done a year ago and you're cash settling now, then inflation would be included in most cases from the time of assessment to the time of settlement. But if you settle today and you don't build for another year, um, forward inflation is not included. So it's just inflation that has already been incurred rather than inflation that might be. So once you've agreed the scope of the damage and the associated costs, a cash settlement does enable you to do a number of things. So one of the things that um, a lot of customers find useful is that you can use your own builder. And the reason that we point this out is because most insurers will have builders that they will use, but they won't move outside of those builders. So if you've got someone that's not included in your insurer's program um, management office, then this gives you a way of using your own builder. It also allows you to make additional changes or to completely change the layout. Again, most insurers won't allow you to make changes to the layout of your home if they're managing the reinstatement. And that's because the policy is there to put back what was there before the earthquake. So that's what your insurer will do. But they're not gonna to want to project manage a completely different house rebuild. Um, it also allows you to do things like sell or retain your home and land and rebuild in a different location, um, maybe buy an existing home. There's a lot of people that have never wanted to build a home. So a cash settlement does, does give you an option to buy an existing home at another location or to reinstate your home in your own time frame. Now, the only thing you do need to think about is if you're putting it off, so if you're accepting a cash settlement and you're going to do the reinstatement, but you're going to do it in your own time frame and it's a year or two years or three years down the track, it might have a effect on your ongoing insurance. So you just wanna to speak to your insurer before you do that um, to make sure that you're not going to then be at any disadvantage with ongoing insurance. And I'll talk a bit more about that in detail. There's been some questions put through to the hub. So these are some of the questions um, that have been asked. So what are the differences between purchasing another property elsewhere and rebuilding on the property when calculating a cash settlement? There will be some things that will be included if you're rebuilding on your current site that may not be included if you're buying an existing home elsewhere or rebuilding somewhere else. And some of those things would be um, retaining walls if you're on the hill. So if you have retaining walls and you're going to reinstate on a site with retaining walls, then they would be included. But if you're going to build on a flat site and so you won't be incurring the cost to rebuild the retaining wall, they may not. And that again comes down to that conversation about what's your intention at the time of cash settlement. Um, in terms of what will be included and excluded, again, it's very individual. So as I mentioned, inflation on forward inflation is not included. Back inflation generally would be. Project management costs, it really depends on how you're going to manage the reinstatement. So if you're working with a group home builder that has a project manager as part of the package, then additional project management costs wouldn't usually be included. But if you're working with a um, one man band type builder who didn't have a project manager, you might ask for those project management costs to be included. Um, foundations, if the foundations are damaged, they should be included in your cash settlement offer unless you've made a um, deal with your insurer that they're going to do the foundations for you and you're going to manage from foundations up, which some insurers are doing and some customers are requesting. And then expert reports, if your insurer has already incurred the cost for the expert reports, there won't be an allowance included. So if we've already done geotechnical reports and structural engineering reports and we've got architectural designs done, then we're not going to include the costs for those experts in the cash settlement. If we haven't, and they would be incurred in the reinstatement, then we would. So that's where a conversation right up front with your insurer is useful, because if you want to manage the entire thing, you don't want your insurer to go and incur costs, then you should tell them that at the start and they would be included. But if we've already incurred it, we don't include it again, but we will give you those reports. Um, how long will it take to process or sort each of the options? Now, the time 
is really in getting the expert reports. So if we've already got the engineering, we've got the building reports, we've agreed the scope of works, we've got the QS reports, then actually from the time it takes to agree the number and have the money in your bank is a week. It's not long at all, but the time is in getting all of those things. If you're freshly over cap from EQC or new into the process, to get to that point could take three to six months. And the reason for that is all the expert reports that are needed and the time that it takes to get each of those. Again, if you just come over cap, it is really good to have a conversation with your insurer and talk about the process that you've already been through with EQC. Because EQC may have a lot of these reports and if you're happy with them, then tell your insurer that. Your insurer might be able to get a QS report done on the EQC reports and it means that you save months in extra assessments that may not be needed. If you'd already started the process of repair or rebuild with your insurer, doesn't mean that you need to start again. So for example, I saw one this week, the home and I had been working with Homes by Maxim, which is one of our building companies, very happy with Homes by Maxim, have all the plans done at the point of about to build. So what we will do now is we'll just put the money in their bank and the only difference is the bank does the milestone payments rather than us. So they'll continue with the same process they were going through, but they'll just pay the builder direct. So some of the things you should do before, even before you start thinking about a cash settlement is seek advice. So one of the most important um, places to go is to your insurer's sales team. And I'll just talk through the ongoing insurance in a bit more detail, but it is really important to tell them about the options you're thinking of, because then they'll tell you how long you will have insurance in place, what kind of insurance you'll have in place, and what you need to do to get full cover reinstated. Your broker, if you have one, the broker plays a really important role. They can tell you about policy entitlements, but also they can help with the negotiation. Um, a real estate professional, good idea to speak to someone. If you're looking at options, what could I sell my house as is for today? What could I sell it for if I do the repair? What are other houses selling for? What could I buy an existing home for? They'll be able to give you an idea of the market. Um, your bank will have an interest and in a small number of cases, the bank will actually say to us, we don't want you to cash settle this claim, we want you to reinstate. And they will have an interest, whether it's structural or cosmetic damage. So naively, I thought myself as a homeowner, well, I'll take that money for the cosmetic damage and I won't worry about doing it. The bank is still interested in that because it can devalue the property and if they've got a mortgage on the property, they want to make sure that that's protected. And obviously your lawyer can talk you through the legal implications of any choice that you make. So in terms of ongoing insurance, once you cash settle, the insurance policy that's on your home will be reviewed and it will be amended as part of the final settlement. The ongoing cover that's available depends on whether your home is a repair or a rebuild. So if you cash settle on a rebuild, you've been indemnified for that loss and the policy is cancelled at the time of settlement. As the owner of the property, you can extend your contents policy. So if you want some liability cover, there is a way of doing that. And you can also extend cover on any undamaged buildings on the site. But the policy on your house is cancelled. And then once the rebuild's complete, if you've been, and this I am talking quite specifically about IAG here, because I know about other insurers' claims processes. I don't know enough probably to talk about their sales processes. But if we provide cover, if we provided cover for you at the time of loss and you rebuild, we will provide cover again. So I know there was a lot of concern from people in Christchurch about new cover not being available and worried about letting policies lapse and whether they'd be able to get policies in the future. What we have guaranteed is if we provided cover, as long as the house is built, there's a code of compliance, there's no events in between now and the time of the house being built, then we will provide cover. Um, in terms of repairs, so we'll continue to insure the home while you make arrangements for the repair, but it is important that arrangements to do the repair are made. So if you have a sum insured on a house of $500,000, we cash settle $150,000 because that's the damage of the repair, then the sum insured would reduce to $350,000. But we will check in at each renewal to make sure that there's arrangements being made to fix the damage, and if there hasn't, there is a chance that cover could be cancelled altogether. So what you want to do is just have a conversation with your insurer at the time that you take the cash settlement and that you decide what you're going to do with it to make sure that if you need cover, some people will choose to self-insure and won't be worried whether there's cover available or not. But if you need to have cover in place, you want to make sure that it is going to be available based on the decision that you make. 
And in terms of repair, what we would need to reinstate full cover would be if the work is consentable, we'd want to see the consent and we'd want a code of compliance certificate. If there's structural work that is exempt, then we'd want to see a scope of works and you could use the scope of works that we've given you for the cash settlement. But we'd want to see producer statements from a qualified structural engineer to say that that work has been done in line with the scope of works. And then for cosmetic damage, we'd want a statement from the tradesperson who carried out the repair and also any receipts or photographic evidence of the repair that's been done. Now that is quite technical, so there is a fact sheet available and it's in the thing down the back. So if you are looking at ongoing insurance, make sure that you take one of those with you. As I say, it's quite specific to us, but for any insurer reinstating cover, that would be what they would want before they reinstate the cover. And I'll hand over with only five seconds over time to John. Thanks, Sarah. Thanks, Renee. And good evening, everyone. I'm pleased to be here tonight talking about cash settlements from a community law point of view, wearing the RAS hat. So um, cash settlements, let's get underway. Um, I'm going to be deliberately brief tonight um, because there's already a lot of really good information out there. There have been previous seminars on this issue or similar issues. So there was one on the 30th of April, understanding your cash settlement offer. One on the 14th of May, cash settlements, what are my options? And last week as well, understanding your cash settlement offer as well, and tonight's one too. So there is good information out there, and I highly recommend it, including the question and answer sessions. Um, first of all, the first issue is, well, um, is it a situation where you have to accept a cash settlement or can you have a managed repair or a rebuild? That's been quite a topical issue since about March of this year. Um, in terms of EQC claims, the Earthquake Commission Act Section 29 does say that the Commission can settle claims either by cash or by reinstatement. And in terms of most insurance policies, they do give the insurer the option of paying cash or reinstating damaged property. But that's not the end of the story. Um, so if someone, if EQC or insurer has said that they will accept you into the managed repair program or they will rebuild your house, then um, they may be bound to do that. And so there are a number of causes of action that you can rely on. One of them is Section 9 of the Fair Trading Act 1986, which says that no person in trade may engage in conduct that is misleading or deceptive. So it means that you can't say one thing and do another. So if you've said that you're going to do a repair then, and um, the person has relied on that, then you may be bound by that. Equitable estoppel is another one, but that relies on there being an unequivocal representation, so it's a little more difficult to prove than the Fair Trading Act. But if there has been a statement to that effect, which is clear that there will be a managed repair, then um, and ensure or EQC cannot cash settle halfway down the process. And the doctrine of election is another example, and that probably covers a situation where either EQC or insurer has applied for building consent with the intention of carrying out the building work. They can't do that and then somewhere along the process say, right, now we're going to cash settle this claim, here's the check. Um, they probably would be bound to ensure that you could have a managed repair or a managed rebuild. I think it's really important to understand the differences between cash settlement and managed repair because what you're doing here is you're making decisions which are going to have quite far-reaching implications. This is your house, probably your most valuable asset, and you need to make really good business decisions about it. So let's talk about cash settlement. Um, one of the strengths of um, the IAG policy and their approach is that the cash settlement does give you a lot of flexibility. So the funds can be used for a range of purposes. You don't have to put them all into doing a repair or a rebuild on your existing site. Um, with the cash settlement, if it is full and final, it means that you cannot revisit it. You cannot say, but actually, this costs $20,000 more. Can, I, can you please pay the difference? The answer is likely to be no. So full and final means full and final. Um, with a cash settlement where there is risk about cost escalation um, and that kind of thing, that's dealt with by payment of contingencies. 
and that's an industry-wide practice. Um, with a cash settlement process, when there is a discharge and the money is paid out, that's the end of the process. It doesn't go beyond that date. And with a cash settlement um, process, there is no independent oversight as there would be with a consentable repair or a consentable rebuild, um, where there would be council inspectors and a code compliance certificate at the end. However, strongly encouraged, as Renee said, to seek advice um, depending on what issues are raised by your cash settlement. So moving away from cash settlement to a managed repair, with a managed repair, you have less flexibility. You can only use the funds for the purposes of the repair or the rebuild. Um, but it doesn't end when the building work ends necessarily. So there would normally be a defect list. Under the Building Act, there's a period of 12 months where you can go back and require a builder to remedy any defects. Um, also, under the Building Act, there's a 10-year period where potentially a builder can be liable for substandard work. If there need to be variations to the building contract because new damage is discovered, then that is dealt with by variations to the contract. What happens with a variation is that the builder or project manager will go back to the insurer and say, do you approve of this variation? And if it's for earthquake damage, they will approve. If it's not, they may not approve. Um, so if they approve of the variation, then the contract is varied and the, the risk is dealt with in that way. And finally, for a consentable repair, um, there will be council inspections, and so there is independent oversight through the building consent process. And for exempt repairs, often a P producer statement, PS1 or PS4, is required. So for foundation repairs, that means that there will be engineering sign-off. So you do have that comfort um, in that process. Um, so moving back to cash settlements, what issues do we need to be sure that we've covered off? First of all, um, both parties, both the insurer and the insured, should agree about the extent of earthquake damage. If there's not agreement, then that can be a problem because if you go to cost of damage, you might not be costing the right damage. So you, the homeowner, you want to capture all of it. So all the earthquake damage you want to capture in that scope. Um, then there's the issue of the appropriate repair methodology and um, you may need to engage an engineer. You might need to know how the site's performing. Is it TC1, TC2, TC3? Um, is it good ground? Is, is, are the ground conditions variable? What is the bearing capacity of the land? Um, you might need to know whether it's possible to re-level a foundation or whether a full foundation replacement is required, whether the, a house needs to be lifted. So there are all these sorts of questions that need to be addressed. And overall, um, you just need agreement on the scope of works. When you get to the costing stage, and so you've agreed on what's going to be costed, then you can go to a quantity surveyor who costs how much building work costs, and um, they will go through every item and work out how much a fair and reasonable assessment of it is. And that assessment should include key things such as the cost of enhanced foundations, which is quite a high percentage of building costs, especially on TC3 sites. It should also include the cost of professional fees, which Renee referred to earlier as well, and that may vary from site to site. It should include contingency costs, so there's some cushion in case um, the building work costs more than initially anticipated, and um, other miscellaneous items, things like contract works insurance and allowances for temporary accommodation, those sorts of things. So, um, as you can see, it's not just a matter of receiving an offer from an insurer and accepting it, but there's a whole process to work through, and everything needs to be ticked off as being correct. So, overall, there needs to be a proper basis for any cash settlement amount. Um, finally, what's the appropriate forum? And certainly for scoping issues, there's no substitute for a site visit. Walking around with a loss adjuster or whoever's assessing the damage and just checking that they have captured everything. Um, as a homeowner, you really are the expert. You knew, know what it was like before the earthquakes. You're probably aware of where most of the damage is, whereas someone who's just there for um, a couple of hours, first time they've seen the house, they have much less knowledge than you do. So um, don't be scared of drawing on the knowledge that you already have. Sometimes um, 
to address those sorts of issues, it can be good to have a meeting at an insurer's office. Face to face is always better than relying on emails or, or picking up the phone if you're talking to someone new all the time. Um, sometimes it can be really helpful to meet at an independent venue. You might, if there are trust and confidence issues, to be somewhere where no one seems to have an advantage can be a good way of going. And it might help to have an independent facilitator. At RAS we have facilitated meetings where we have trained facilitators who are also mediators and they, they can um, set down what the process is so that it's fair to both parties. Both parties have a chance to have their say. And that can be really helpful because the length of time it's taking to settle these claims has been difficult for everyone. And sometimes it's really hard to stay constructive and solution focused, but really meetings, it's important to make the most of that opportunity to make as much progress as you can. It's also good to be really clear about what the issues are because you may need to have experts attend a meeting so that they can address issues such as how the site is performing or what is the appropriate repair methodology. And so you want people who can comment on that. So if they are needed, then they should be there. Otherwise, you might have to reschedule a meeting, which just drags things out a little bit more. And finally, what process is going to help you? So do you have such a good relationship with your insurer that a one-to-one -one negotiation is going to get it sorted? Or do you need an independent facilitator? Or are you poles apart that you just need to find someone who can decide who is correct, such as an arbitrator or taking matters to court? I think it all comes back to the process. So you have to think of what your own circumstances are and how the process can be tailored to meet your needs as well as the interests of the insurer. Insurers want to get these claims settled as quickly as they can because they need certainty as well when they're dealing with their reinsurers. But um, as homeowners, you also need certainty as well because this has gone on for quite a long time and it would be good to get it all sorted out so that people can move on.